Okay, with that as a starting point, let's talk about, okay, we got our view, we've uh, got some things in it in terms of the filtering. Let's talk about the annotations and what we can actually add to the view to go through and like uh, kind of help explain it. The biggest thing is probably dimensions. We've played around that a little bit so far, but we'll keep on going with that. There's the whole idea of detail lines and regions. We'll talk about that. And then text and tags. So let's talk about dimensions first. The big idea with the dimensions is you're going to basically choose different points in the geometry and string dimensions between them. And really, to use the uh, dimensions to answer the question of how big is this. So it's always pick the reference lines, then click, click somewhere in the drawing area to actually place the dimension line. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's go back over to the model, and you can go to your model. It would be nice if within your model you had some dimensions kind of explaining uh, you know, the floor plan, uh, just how big things are. So let's put some dimensions down in this view. I'll even go to the, uh, I'll go to one that isn't dimensioned, yeah, now. Let me go to the model only, and I'll duplicate that. Yes? Yes. Oh, let's hang on. Let me see if I can hang on. In level two, or in in the in the duplicate copy, it's not showing the oh level two, or like the board. Yes. No worries. Let's take a look at that. It's up in here. It's another property. How observant of you to notice. It's another property we're going to get into. There's this whole notion of uh, view range, and there's also this notion of whether something is underlaid. And let me show you where it is to turn that on. It's a property of the view. What the underlay does as a property is it gives you the option of showing another view underneath it, but grayed out, just to kind of give you a point of reference. OK. so. For this one, that's a view property. It didn't get copied as part of the view. Um, if I go to this add dimensions, that view, it's not showing here. If I want to turn that on as an underlay, I can open the view properties. And again, how I do that is view properties, VP. And I can choose the underlay and say, let me underlay level two. And then it'll put level two in there as in gray. Underlaying is actually a really helpful thing to do, especially in multi-story houses, because you want to sometimes line up the walls on the first floor with the second floor. Or even as you're placing stairs, you'd like to sort of see where the second floor landing is relative to the first floor. So underlaying is a really good thing to do. Yeah, You can choose things in the underlay. So I'm actually choosing things on the second floor, even though I'm looking at the first floor right now, which gets a little confusing sometimes. But uh, you know, it's good to kind of keep track of that. Okay. Let's put some dimensions on this thing. We'll go to the Annotate tab. And again, these dimensions are only going to apply to this view, because annotations only apply to this view. You can choose any of these different styles, aligned, linear, angular, radial, just depends on what you're dimensioning. In general, the aligned is your best choice 9 out of 10 times. Okay. Aligned is it'll draw a dimension that follows the wall. It'll follow whatever it is. So if you have something that's kind of going off at an oblique angle, it'll follow that, as opposed to rationalizing it back into horizontal and vertical. Okay. And when you place these dimensions, let's talk about how it works. You have the notion of are you picking the wall faces, the wall cores, or the, face, you know, the, the center lines? Okay, and you can choose. And don't worry, this is sort of where it's going to try to go. Okay, but if uh, we want to go through and customize it, we can tab and select a different place or adjust it after the fact. Okay, and we have the notion, are we going to pick an entire wall or pick individual references? So let me do the wall center lines first and individual, show you what that looks like. Okay, if I go wall center lines, if I hover over a wall, it'll pick the center line. I hover over this wall, it'll pick the center line. And every time I'm hovering, I'm just clicking. And what I'm doing now is putting in a chain of dimensions. Okay, And then when I go off and I click somewhere out in the drawing area and click right there, I actually have the dimension. Now, since this is a chain of dimensions, I have this whole notion of whether I want to make these things equal. I don't want to in this case, because I don't want to move all those walls around to be evenly spaced. 
but I could turn that on and it'll shove all the walls around to make those evenly spaced. So the 8, 8, 16, and 16 would be 48, 4, 6, 12. <laughs> we have to have a bunch of 12 foot rooms. <laughs> okay, but I won't do that right now. Try that in the other dimension too. Go ahead and do the aligned and if you're doing this in your own drawing, just go ahead and do it to the center lines. That's probably fine for where we are right now. I can string a dimension out like that. Now, just as a matter of course, so you know how we typically dimension drawings, I'll often dimension wall to wall like that. But what we'll usually also do is put another dimension in that looks like this. It'll go all the way from side to side. We'll call that an overall dimension. Now the nice thing about dimensions is they're associative. If anything changes in the model, they will change. And it's sort of a two-way relationship. So for example, if I choose that, I can drag the wall and the dimension will update itself as we do that. Or if you prefer, you can come over here and say, I just want to put in a specific number and use the dimension to drive the geometry. So it'll work either way. So dimensions are sort of a good thing to put in. You want dimensions, it helps everyone sort of understand, oh, it's 8 by 13. Okay, that's a reasonable bedroom. Well, actually, it's not really a reasonable bedroom, but it's, <laughs> by today's developer standards, it's a common size for a bedroom. Okay, so let's pause right there for a second. How are people doing in terms of getting some basic dimensions down? Oh, no worries. What I do is first I choose the wall, okay, and then the dimension line will show up in blue, and then I can click on the value. Now let me warn you about this because everyone will do this the first time and it sort of just gets you confused. If you click on the dimension and try to change the value, it'll give you this thing that'll let you change the text of the dimension, but doesn't actually change the true positioning. Okay. Okay, not really a very wise practice because it's it's kind of messy to have dimensions in your drawings that don't actually model the ge model geometry or don't don't match the model geometry. So uh, avoid that if you can. It's always select the object and oh, I want that room to be nine feet wide as opposed to eight feet wide. Okay, and I got some sort of conflict. If I looked in 3D, I'd figure out what that is. Oh, it's because uh, we're we're bumping into the stairs. I can't have that. Okay, now dimensions as you add them, let's talk about how you can go through and change things a little bit. If you go through and you have your dimensions and they're going to the center lines of the wall, that's okay for as we're getting started. As we get a little bit further along in the process, we'll actually learn to start dimensioning to faces of cores, things like that. And let's zoom on in and kind of show you what that might look like. Now, in this view, since my view is currently set to be at a very coarse level of detail, I need to sort of bump it up to fine in order to see the layers of the wall. And let me even, after I do that, pop it in here. Let me see if I can switch it over to thin lines to make it a little bit more obvious what's going on. In fact, I'll even shade it to make it a little more, even more obvious what's going on. Okay, here's the deal. Currently, we're dimensioning to the center line of the walls. If I would like to dimension to the face of the wall or to the face of the core, which I would like to do if I'm actually producing framing plans, okay, or uh, something where I actually care about that difference, what you can do is click on the dimension, and when you click on the dimension, each of the different reference lines has this little blue handle. You can move the witness line by clicking that. If you just click it, it'll rotate through the different choices. It's going to the outer faces, back to the center line, to the inner face, outer face, center line. So you can click on that little handle if you want to, and that'll sort of just jump it around a little bit. Another thing you can do if you'd like to have a little more fine control is you can actually, if you right click on that thing, say something where you move the witness line. And when you move the witness line, it gives you the option of tabbing to choose different locations. And if you hover near something and then tab, it'll switch you through the different options it thinks you're considering. So I can choose that, and now I'm dimensioning to the inner face of the core. Or the f yeah. So we can move dimension lines too. So yeah, once you get dimensions, you can add to them, you can subtract to them. For example, if you decide over here that I really don't want that witness line anymore right there, I can right click on that and say just delete that witness line. It'll take it back out. 
Or if you decide after you've already placed a dimension that you want to extend the dimension to include a few more witness lines, you can add them in too. So you can take them out or add them. Either way works. And to do that, we choose that guy here. We right click on him. And there's this thing that says edit witness lines. And the edit witness lines lets us basically choose some new points. So I might want to choose that point. Or I could even do, like I sort of forgot the garage last time. I could pull it all the way out here and just add to the, uh, the, the length too. So you'll play with dimensions. There's sort of a lot of kind of groovy variations in terms of how you work with dimensions. But it pretty much comes down to place them and then sort of it's really all about just moving the witness lines around to make sure you're getting the face that you want. Let me give you just one other little variation on the dimension lines in that. Oh, when you're done editing, just click out into space somewhere. Click in the drawing area, and that'll take care of that. If you have a curved wall surface, and I think many of you have some cur I've seen some curved wall surfaces floating around in some of the projects I've been looking at. Okay, It's kind of hard to dimension along the length of that wall. So we have some other dimensioning options available for you. For these, we tend to often do things in terms of saying what the radius of the curvature is. If you choose the radius, you just click on there, and it'll put what the radius of that curvature is. Okay, another variation on this same sort of theme is, what if you have two walls that are sort of angled relative to each other? So something like that. And we wanted to know what the angle was between those two different walls. So that's just another type. That's our angular here to here. Again, these all still drive, even though uh, if I click on that, actually, I have to click on the wall. I can say, no, I want that to be 45 degrees instead, or 60 degrees. So again, it's associative and will drive in either directions. Here's arc length. We don't, I don't tend to use that one very much. That's going to be just pretty much along the length of this arc. Here and here. And that's for actually just measuring along the curvature. OK, so go ahead and play with dimensions. Again, for your first assignment, if you can get some dimensions on there to give me the basic uh, like uh, parameters about how big the room are. Super. We want that. We want some of that. But don't worry if your dimensions, you don't have all the nuance down yet for this first assignment. We're going to get a lot more practice with dimensions and how they use them to control things as we keep on going with the next assignment. OK, so just get some basic dimensions in there, and we'll be in pretty good shape. OK, pretty good on dimensions. How are we feeling about dimensions? Close enough? OK. Fantastic. Popping over here. Let's go ahead and as our next adventure. We'll talk about text and how we're using text. Now, when we're adding text to things, I'm going to show you three different sort of approaches, or actually two today, of how we add text. One is just sort of putting text in there. The other way is actually using tags to sort of indicate what the text is. But let's start with just plain old text. OK, now text, oh, you all know how to word process, so this is not going to be anything new. If, for example, in my floor plan view, it's not entirely obvious to me that that's representing a desk, okay, which it may not be entirely obvious to you, what you can do is go to the Annotate tab, choose the Text tool, and let's take a look at what the options are. In the Text tool, we have the whole option, is there no leader? Is there one leader or two leaders? Is it straight or curved? And is it sort of a left center or right justified? We also have sort of a size over here. Now, it's indicated in terms of a specific size, like quarter inch text. That actually refers to how big it'll be when it's printed out. So relative to the sheet, it'll be one quarter inch tall. So that'll actually change a little bit. If you change the scale of your drawing, the text will sort of stay that same size, but it may look bigger relative to the walls because text is actually sort of locked at the size, and it'll sort of adjust relative to the scale. Let me kind of show you what I mean by that. So I got the quarter inch text. Let me go ahead and just I'll do something with no leader, and I'll even center it. I'll just come right on down here and just put that. That's the desk. 
That may be a little bit big in the scheme of things, but I can stretch it out a little bit. If that's still feeling a little bit too big, maybe I can change it down to 332nd, make it a little smaller. Okay, so that's just a text piece. There's really not much to it. Okay, here's how that sizing thing works. The sizing thing works is 332nd when we're displaying a drawing at 8th inch is at this size. If I would change that to be 332nd at a quarter inch instead, That text is actually still going to print at the same size. It's just much smaller relative to the drawing scale. Okay? If I switch to the other direction, if I said to 16th scale, you'll see once again the text is big relative to the size of the object. So the objects are resizing to the scale, but the text is actually locked to a specific size. Just to let you know, so if you go through and Put all your text on before setting the scale. You can have this like sort of nasty cleanup at the end. What I would probably recommend doing is as you're creating all your views, pay attention to the scale. And what's a good scale for your views? For your little research projects, I'd recommend quarter scale. So one quarter inch equals a foot. For that size of building, that's sort of a very common size most architects and designers will understand. So quarter scale is pretty good. Half scale is too big, even though it would fill the entire sheet. We tend to save half scale for detailed bathroom or kitchen plans, something that's a very isolated view. Eighth scale and sixteenth scale is more for big commercial buildings or buildings where we need to sort of squeeze everything down. So for residential work and sort of small scale construction, quarter scale is a very common scale. So we got that, put that there. I'd say set the scale first and then make your labels appropriate to that scale drawing. Otherwise, <laughs> if you end up changing the scale after the fact, your labels may get very big or very small relative to what you'd want them to be. So go ahead and get that set up as much as you can beforehand. Another variation on this scheme is the notion of text that has a leader. How that works is as follows. I'm going to choose the text with a leader. I'll put two segments on it. I'll even make it sort of uh, left justified. And what I can do is just drag on down. This is the leader. And this is the uh, door to the kitchen. Okay. Again, what's the leader for? The leader is really just to give you a little pointer where you can sort of indicate, oh, it's this specific thing. So it just gives you that ability to kind of point to a specific object in there. So don't belabor it. It's just really sort of this notion if you want to put text down and you're not just sort of putting it in the region, but you're actually pointing to something. Go ahead and give yourself a little leader. Now, text, most of you get pretty easily. Text just sort of works out very nicely. You can change and create different sizes of text just by uh, coming on over here, choosing different styles. And if we don't have a style we like, what do we do? We go to the type properties and we duplicate it. And I can say, oh, I'll make it red. So that style will be with a red color. Say OK. And now I can choose between the black and the red. Just kind of choose what you want. So go ahead and create as many different text styles as you need. Think of them very much like styles in Microsoft Word or something. Now, I'll contrast text with this next notion, which we'll call tagging. Text annotation, that's editing the text properties. We just looked at that. Let's talk about tags and what tags are good for. Tags are even sort of one step better than text, because text has this bad property in that it's just, it's just text. It doesn't really understand what it is. Tags actually say, hey, you got some building elements here maybe I can sort of pull some information about that building element and present that. And it'll be dynamically linked to the element. So if anything changes about the element, the text will change with it. So that's a little bit better in the scheme of things because then, oh, the same sorts of uh, elements are, you know, what it, or the, the text and the elements are staying in sync with each other. So we're going to look at the other variation, which is called tagging. And let's take a look at that. 
Now, you may have encountered tags as you work, just because as you go through and you put in doors and windows, it tends to throw these tags in by default in floor plan views. It doesn't do it in 3D views, but in floor plan views, it throws tags in. And that may be confusing you, but let's try to demystify some of that for you now. There's this notion of tagging and tagging by category. And the idea is there's window tags, there's door tags, there's you can really put tags on any element in there and choose what information you want to display. But one piece of information you may want to display is, for example, on the doors. Okay, so the tags can either have a leader, which is what that little line is there, or not have a leader. Let me just turn it off. But I can tag that door, <coughs> and I can tag this. That's an opening. That's a little bit different. Let me tag that door. That's a door right there. Let me tag it. That one I'll put a leader on, because it's going to sort of be right in the middle. So let's talk about what those things are. OK, I got these tags, and these random numbers are sort of showing up there. So what are those random numbers showing us? OK, the, window, uh, the door tag by default is showing us it's the ID number of each of those different doors. So this is door number five. That's door number nine. That's door number seven. That number is just determined by the order in which they were placed. And we can change any of those things. If you decide that instead you want that to be door number 99, we can change that. Let me show you where it's coming from. If I choose the door and look at the instance properties, you'll see it's door number five. Okay, That's its mark as opposed to its type mark. If I want it to be door number 99, I can change that. It'll change in the tag. I can also go through and click in the tag and change it there. No, it's 109. Okay, and again, what I'm actually doing now is changing the database. So tags are really just a little teeny tiny portal into the database that let you start displaying the values and changing the values. And where tags are very, very useful is as follows. Let me kind of show you how this works. Okay, as I go through and I put up my plan and I have all these different doors, I may want to have information about all the doors displayed somewhere. And rather than loading it down into the graphical view, it may make more sense to put a tabular view that says, oh, door number 109 is 32 inches by 80 inches. It's a wooden door. It came from the Simpson Manufacturing Company. You put a little table of all those things. And really what 109 is, that ID is really it's your key. It's just your point for referring into the table. OK, so let's take a look at how that looks. If I want to look at our views in a tabular form, I can actually take a look at our schedules. I don't look like I have any schedules defined in this project yet. If for your project, I think if you started with a template, there was already a door schedule and a window schedule there. So why don't you try opening that? I'll create a new schedule. I'll say schedules. I'm going to create a schedule of what? I'm going to schedule the doors. And we'll go through this in a little more detail in a second. But within the schedules, you can choose the different fields you want to show. So for example, the mark is the ID number. Let me go ahead and put in there, I can put in its width. I'm just choosing fields. I can put in its height. I can put in, oh, the manufacturer or any other information I want to put in there. Say OK. And here's the schedule. So. Here's the door schedule showing these are the different door numbers. Here are the dimensions of them. Here's the manufacturer. Not much information in there right now. But again, this is all just another view of the mo that model. So if I put in there a different number, no, that's door 200, and it really wants to be 3 foot 6 as opposed to 3 feet. Actually, I shouldn't change that there because it's going to change the type. I should create a new type for doing that. Um, let me go back over to the level 1. You'll see that's door 200 now. So really, these tags are just a way of cross-referencing things between the tabular views and displaying what's over there in the model. So let me go ahead and put another, uh, for example, on the piece of furniture here. I can put a tag on that, because we often schedule our furniture, because someone has to order it someday. We'll annotate it. I'll say tag it. I'll choose that says it doesn't really have a tag loaded for furniture objects right now. Would you like to load one? I'll say, sure. They're under annotations, probably under architectural. It's a furniture tag. I'll put a piece of tag on that furniture. 
And I think that it's kind of sitting there looking kind of blank right now. Let's talk about what that's all about. Although we got a tag over there, whatever that tag is displaying doesn't have a value for it right now. OK, so how can we sort of figure out about that? If you choose any of the tags, sometimes there's some type properties, but this doesn't look like it has very much. In turn, this just sort of has standard versus boxed. If you want to see what's actually displayed there and customize it, you can choose that tag. And like a lot of things, you can edit it. You can go through and change its properties and customize what it's going to display. So for example, I can edit the family. Okay, and this is getting to sort of be like more extra for experts, but uh, if this is getting a little confusing, don't worry, you probably won't need to do this for the assignment. It's showing what's called the type mark. That is for that piece of furniture. Um, that chair has some sort of ID associated with it. So all the Corbusier chairs would have that same type mark. If I'd prefer, I can go ahead and put the type name in there. Maybe put them both in there. And I'll load that back into my project. I'll put it back into, oh, I got several of them open, don't I? That makes me worry. OK. So now we have the notion, it's just actually tagged with the type name in there. Maybe I'll make that in a standard one that doesn't have the box around it. But the nice thing about doing something like that is if I tag it and it sort of shows it a type name, super. If I change it to a different piece of furniture, it'll change it to show its type name instead. Okay, so tagging is just sort of a very useful way of if you have information in your model displaying that as opposed to putting the text in there. So whenever you can, I'll encourage you to tag as opposed to text. Okay? So the most common thing you'll do with tags right now is you'll put tags on doors and windows so that your door and window schedules have some sort of reference between the graphical representation and the tabular representation. Sort of pretty good? If you're doing good, let's go ahead and I won't belabor all the annotations, but instead we're going to talk a little about like how we apply these to some other views. Okay, this is the notion right here of just changing the information displayed in the tag, and that's where we edit the tag, and then we can change just really any of the properties that are available, any of the instance or type properties could be displayed in that tag. It's all just database values.